Hello, Modern Europe, and welcome to Unit 6, Nationalism and Political Reform. We are almost to Reading Week. How exciting is that? So today, we're going to end the first half of the term with an exciting development. The creation of two brand new countries, Germany and Italy, which will completely upset the balance of power in Europe and ultimately lead to the First World War. So let's get started. The learning objectives for this unit are, number one, understand why the Congress system collapsed in Europe. Number two, describe how Germany and Italy emerged in the late 19th century as independent countries. Number three, understand how these developments changed the balance of power in Europe. So in the years following the revolutions of 1848, things essentially went back to the way they were before. So in France, we got rid of the Second Republic and Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III, after his coup d'etat, started calling himself an emperor, just like his uncle had, and France became an empire once again. The reforms were rolled back in places like Prussia and Austria, and the nationalist ideas of uniting Italian-speaking lands into one country or uniting German-speaking lands into one country, well, they all failed. However, the Concert of Europe, now if you recall, the Concert of Europe was this idea that uh, the old aristocratic order um, could prevent wars happening again. Uh, the idea that it would be old men and cigars sitting in a room and they would sort out problems without the trouble of regular people interrupting them. Well, this Concert of Europe would really be put to the test just a few years after the revolutions of 1848 when a war broke out between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. A war about a tiny little peninsula of land in the Black Sea, a place which has, in fact, continued to be a subject of world interest, the Crimea. Okay, so the Crimea is this little area right here. And if you follow the news in recent years, uh, you recall that it had uh, been part of the Ukraine, and then in 2014, Russia invaded, uh, and so now it's occupied by Russia, and everybody got up in arms about that. Um, so... It, in this time period, it was controlled by uh, Russia. and um, But at the same time, it was also desired by the Ottoman Empire, obviously for its strategic importance, because whoever controls the Crimea really can control the Black Sea. So this would essentially be a war between Russia and the Ottoman Empire over who controlled the Black Sea. However, it would drag in uh, many other major powers in Europe into this conflict, and that's why it would really put to the test the concept of the Concert of Europe. So here's just a close-up of the Black Sea and the region of the Crimea right here. Um, so if you're confused about the Crimea, you're not alone. Uh, the Crimea has been controlled by many different peoples over the centuries, and it does have quite a bit of strategic importance, which is probably why uh, it keeps being you know, fought over, essentially. Um, uh, so it, during this time, it was controlled by Russia. Uh, during the uh, era of the Soviet Union, it would actually be gifted by um, the premier of the Soviet Union to the Ukraine. And Ukraine would then control it for the next several decades until uh, 2014 when uh, Russia invaded and Russia uh, continues to hold it still to this day. So obviously, the main rival for Russia in controlling the Black Sea is the Ottoman Empire to the south. And these two empires had been um, at war before, and so it wasn't surprising that they were going to eventually go to war again. However, the other European powers did not like the idea of Russia gaining more power at the expense of the Ottoman Empire. They feared the resurgence of Russia. And so the other European powers, France and Britain, would join in on the Ottoman side. And this would be a very nasty, bloody war, the Crimean War. Uh, and it would, in fact, be the worst war for Europe until we reach the world wars uh, in the 20th century. The Crimean War lasted from 1854 to 1856. Um, ostensibly, it was because Russia said it wanted to protect Christians uh, from being oppressed in the Ottoman Empire. But really, the war was actually about who can uh, control the Black Sea. Um, and as I said, Britain and France came in on the side of the Ottomans. As an interesting little side note, the Crimean War was actually the first war where we actually have photographs. So what you're seeing there on the left-hand side is a photograph from the Crimean War. These are uh, French troops um, 
having a little bit of wine, I guess, on the side of the battlefield, while another uh, French guy is reading the newspaper with his pipe. Um, these uh, photographs were shown in Paris uh, during the war, and they were essentially a form of propaganda, which is why, um, you know, when you look at this, you say, hey, I'm going to sign up to be a soldier. This doesn't look so bad. I can drink wine and read newspapers and hang out with my friends. Sounds like fun. The Crimean War was actually not like that at all. It was very nasty. Um, but uh, you'd be forgiven for not thinking that if you looked at this uh, picture. The Crimean War essentially ended in a stalemate. Um, the um, peace treaty that was signed at the Congress of Paris in 1856 essentially um, initiated a new climate of international competition and rivalry. The uh, Ottoman Empire was weakened, but it was certainly still around. Um, and the Congress system, the idea coming out of the Congress of Vienna, the Concert of Europe, this idea that we could all get along, um, you know, uh, men with cigars in, in the parlor room over brandy, sorting things out like gentlemen, that was over. And instead it would be replaced by something called real politic, the idea that might equals right. This intense rivalry and competition would continue for the next several decades. It would see the birth of countries of Germany and Italy and would continue until we reach the First World War. So the Crimean War and the collapse of the Congress system is ultimately what makes the creation of Germany and Italy possible. As we discussed in the last lecture podcast, both of these areas of Europe had had burgeoning nationalist movements that had come to the forefront during the revolutions of 1848, but both had seen their aspirations thwarted. Um, however, um, the desire of many of the people in those regions to unite together didn't entirely go away. Um, what you see here are two images, nationalistic images. On the left, you see an image um, depicting uh, the king of uh, Prussia, in this case, uh, marching with the um, black, uh, uh, red and orange flags, which had become a symbol of of German uh, unity since uh, the Napoleonic Wars and on the right you see an image of one of the many battles fought by uh, Garibaldi during the wars fought for Italian unity. Both the um, unification of, of Italy and the unification of Germany would ultimately come about uh, through war because the big empires, particularly Austria, um, had so much to lose for the unification of these two countries. And in fact, it's Austria <coughs> that stands in the way. Austria controls territory that, um, that, that the people who want to unify Germany would like to see part of Germany. And on the other side, um, it, parts of what is now Italy were controlled by Austria as well. So it will be through Austria and through war that we'll see the unification of these two countries. So I'm going to talk about that next. So the first um, one I want to talk about is Italy, Italian unification. So in Italy, there was a movement that became stronger and stronger during the 19th century, an Italian nationalistic movement known as the Risorgimento. The Risorgimento um, had uh, newspapers that were published, uh, um, um, which were supporting its cause. Uh, but when you look at Italy, it was made up of many, many different little kingdoms. And this had been the case for uh, pretty much since the Roman Empire. Um, so the largest of them and the most powerful of them was Piedmont Sardinia. Uh, Piedmont Sardinia is up in the upper left-hand corner over here. This is Piedmont Sardinia. Um, whoops, sorry, not Lombardy. Not that part over here, just this part here. Uh, Piedmont Sardinia was a, um, a liberal constitutional monarchy. So this is a, a place where um, it was the most progressive, I suppose, out of all the other areas of um, Italy. Other areas, other kingdoms were uh, a little bit more conservative. So when I say progressive in this sense, I just mean that they had already adopted many of the ideals of the Enlightenment. So we still had a monarchy, but it was a monarchy constrained by law. Um, you know, it was an Enlightenment uh, country. Um, however, other areas of Italy were also controlled by the Austrian Empire, particularly Lombardy and uh, Venetia. So Lombardy, I just, you know, this is that area right here, and Venetia here. Both of these two little kingdoms were actually under the direct control of Austria, so they were part of the Austrian um, Empire. 
So the man most responsible for the unification of Italy really has to be this for this fellow, uh, Camillo de Cavour. He was the prime minister of Piedmont Sardinia, and he was always a strong supporter of the Risorgimento, that is, the Italian nationalistic movement. And he had been slowly trying to position his kingdom to play a larger role in European affairs. Um, in order to try to gain supporters for the concept of a united Italy, he had involved the country in the Crimean War. He f the um, uh, Piedmont Sardinia had fought in the Crimean War. However, they were blocked um, at every turn at trying to achieve their nationalistic ambitions by Austria. Austria had the most to lose from Italian unification, and indeed German unification as well. They had territory in what is now, you would now consider Italy. Um, and so they really didn't like the idea of Italian unification. However, um, Camilla de Cavour managed to convince France, namely Napoleon III, who you met in the uh, last uh, podcast, um, uh, to come on his side against Austria. Um, and he did so by promising um, the territory of Savoy and the area around Nice, which they controlled, to France if they came on their side against Austria. And in 1859, uh, war between them began to finally turn the tide, and Austria was put massively on the defensive, losing several key battles. Now, had something else not happened, probably Austria would have rallied and crushed Piedmont Sardinia and its nationalistic ambitions. However, uh, just at that moment, in the far south of what would one day be Italy, in Sicily, there was a rebellion. Giuseppe Garibaldi. Um, this is a, um, a man who was an experienced general. He'd fought civil wars in Brazil and Uruguay. Uh, he mounted a rebellion in the south of what is now Italy and he began to push north. And what is um, great for history is that he believed very strongly that the Piedmont king should be the leader of an, the eventual united uh, Italy. And in 1860, Italy is born, or at least um, a version of Italy is born. Not all of the territory is quite there yet. It'll take a decade to wrest control um, from, um, from other countries, the last little bit of territory, but we're almost there. So here you see a map of the United Italy. So uh, missing from the initial country of Italy was the Papal States, which wouldn't be added until 1870, and Venetia, which they wouldn't finally get from Austria until 1866 and 1870 uh, when Austria was dealing with German unification at the same time. But we basically, from 1860 onward, we now have a country of Italy. So German unification follows a similar path uh, to Italian unification in that ultimately it's going to have to be borne out through war because too many other countries have a lot to lose. So part of the issues about German unification is where you draw the lines for Germany. If we were trying to unite all German speaking people, then we might imagine a, a very large German country, which would include Austria. But the problem is Austria um, is an empire and it includes more than just German speaking people. It includes at least 15 different minorities, several different languages. Um, although the ruling part of Austria tends to be German, the rest of Austria isn't. And so there were also people who argued for a smaller Germany that excluded Austria then. Now, if we look at all the little tiny German states, the other German states, there's really one German state um, besides Austria that is quite powerful, and that is Prussia. That's Prussia with a P, P-R-U-S-S-I-A. Now, you may be thinking, Prussia sounds a lot like Russia. My goodness, that's very confusing. And it's true, Prussia, Russia, they sound alike, but they're actually completely different. Um, and it's actually only in the English language that Prussia and Russia sound um, the same. Um, Russia in Russian is more like Russia, and Prussia in uh, German would more be like uh, Prussia. Um, so they're, they're not that really that similar, and they have completely different histories, the words. It's just that when they come into English, they look very, very similar, which has caused no amount of chagrin for history students from then on. Um, um, who are trying to understand what the heck is the difference between Prussia and Russia. Suffice to say that Prussia is a German-speaking state, and amongst all the little German states, it is the most powerful. It's also um, uh, one that has industrialized since the Industrial Revolution, um, and it's, it's a military state, so it has a, a fairly large military, enough that it can even, to a certain extent, rival Austria. And so Prussia really does not want to see Austria being part of it because it would mean that Austria would play the dominant role in it. Um, so when German unification comes about, it actually comes about from the Prussian side. 
So Prussia um, moves to essentially unite all German speaking um, uh, kingdoms under its control. So in this sense, the German unification movement is a top down movement rather than a bottom up grassroots movement, um, which we see a little bit more of in Italy. And in order to carve out their country, they're going to have to deal with Austria that doesn't want to see it happen. And they're also probably going to have to deal with other countries as well, like France and Denmark. So the German nation, more so than the Italian nation, is really unified through war. Um, the first of those wars is against Dan uh, Denmark in 1862, and it, that's where Prussia essentially asserts control um, over um, uh, the northern area of what will one day be Germany. Uh, following that is the Austria-Prussian War in 1866. Prussia, who was or uh, Austria, who rather, who was already dealing with the fact that Italy was uniting, now had to deal with the fact that Prussia was joining all the German-speaking. Uh, country together in 1866 they went to war and they pretty much lost and then uh, France also had a lot to lose uh, by uh, Prussia suddenly becoming a, a big new country of Germany and they went to war which lasted from 1870 to 1871 but they also lost and what emerges out of that is the country of Germany so the person most responsible for German unification is this guy Otto von Bismarck the Prime Minister of Prussia uh, now, Bismarck had been a proponent of the smaller Germany, the, a Germany that was dominated by Prussia, which was his country, um, and he was also um, a master of what became known as real politik. A real politik means essentially might equals right. Um, and German unification was achieved really through the force of Prussia, enforced by a top-down, meaning it, it wasn't an organic movement. Prussia forced the other German-speaking regions to be able to join under their control and form the very first German Empire. So in 1871, um, we now have Germany. And what is Germany? Well, first of all, it's a very much a, an authoritarian and militaristic state. It's not really like Italy, which is more of a liberal constitution uh, monarchy in in Germany it, this is a state where it's um, an authoritarian one so not a particularly free or enlightened state but a definitely a nationalistic one um, and overnight Germany becomes the dominant power in Europe that area of Europe uh, all the German speaking lands had heavily industrialized over the 19th century and overnight we suddenly had a complete change in the balance of power in Europe um, uh, now suddenly we had a country born overnight that could rival just about any other country in Europe and this was going to have major implications down the road. So let's turn now to those fragile empires that are so threatened by this wave of nationalism across Europe. Let's take a look at Austria. So certainly there were many people within Austria at the governmental level who recognized that the status quo was not going to be able to continue, that Austria was going to need to make some reforms in order to uh, keep the empire uh, whole as it moved forward. And one of the first steps towards uh, these reforms was uh, the creation of a new constitution which became known as the February patent in 1861 and this constitution um, was you know a relatively remarkable document it um, guaranteed certain um, uh, civil liberties of the people it created a limited form of democracy an elected body of course it didn't do away with an, having an emperor and it also kept intact um, the fact that it was an empire which contained many different component parts many different ethnic groups it did allow for some local government, which was hoped that that would appease uh, the various groups uh, vying for their own nationalistic identities. It didn't entirely um, uh, fix the problems. The biggest group within Austria that was vying for some form of self-control and self-determination of, of their destiny were the Magyars or the Hungarians. And the, uh, this whole reform process would continue uh, with the creation of basically a dual monarchy in 1867, where the empire was essentially split into two halves, which would be autonomous from one another. One side would be Austria, the other side would be Hungary, and then they would have one emperor who would be um, you know, over top of both sides. So that emperor would be still be Franz Joseph, who was the emperor of Austria before, but there was the recognition um, uh, in response to Magyar nationalism uh, that there was sovereignty of the kingdom of Hungary. So instead, they just simply split the, the, the empire in half and Franz Joseph got 
both sides, still as emperor, and he also got the additional title that now he would be the king of Hungary. So this recognition of the Magyars and Hungarian sovereignty within the Austrian, now Austria-Hungary empire, uh, was certainly um, an attempt by the government to stem the tide of nationalistic sentiment within um, the empire. However, it actually in many ways inflamed things further because there were many other groups, different ethnic groups, different languages uh, within the empire that were not recognized by this. The Croats, the Serbs, the Slovaks, the Romanians, all of them, they were left out from this compromise. So the Great Compromise of 1867 dealt with the largest of the ethnic groups short of the Germans, um, but it didn't deal with everybody else. So the problems of Austria-Hungary really didn't entirely go away. So let's turn now to the Ottoman Empire. Now the Ottoman Empire up to the 19th century had been uh, quite the success story. It had emerged at the end of the Middle Ages with a successful wave of conquests culminating with the um, conquering of Constantinople in 1453 um, and the Islamic Empire had pretty much grown then through the early modern period and what you see here on this map is the greatest extent to which it got when you include all the colors there um, and certainly the Ottoman Empire represented the um, a greatest rival to European power in the region of Anatolia, North Africa. Um, and the Ottoman Empire, however, like the um, Austrian Empire, though, was suffering from the rise of nationalism. The Ottoman Empire made up of many different ethnic groups, languages, and religions. Although the ruling group of the Ottoman Empire was Islamic, it also contained many Christians and many Jews as well. By the time we get into the 19th century, some regions of the Ottoman Empire essentially are semi-independent in the sense that the Sultan only has a limited ability to control those regions. One example of that is Egypt. Uh, Egypt is, for all intents and purposes, by the time we get to the mid-19th century, is pretty much independent and over time it will become more and more so. Um, also, there is a growing sense of nationalism within the Balkan region. So the Balkan region is this area right here. So the Balkans contain several different ethnic groups and several different languages. And that nationalism there was also threatening the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. In addition to Austria, the other major rival that the Ottoman Empire uh, faced was Russia. And the, um, that rivalry, of course, had spilled over during the Crimean War, and it spilled over again in a war between Russia and the Ottoman Empire in 1877, the Russo-Turkish War. And this war went very, very badly for Turkey. Um, after the war, uh, the great powers uh, sat down around the bargaining table in 1878 at Berlin, and there they essentially forced um, the Ottoman Empire to give up many of its possessions in the Balkans. So the Ottoman Empire lost Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania. Um, and this region then, controlling this region, really became a sandbox that all the other European powers sort of vied over. That really this becomes one of the issues that um, one could argue is what sparks the First World War. In fact, by the time we get to the eve of the First World War, the Ottoman Empire has fallen in power to such a degree that is sometimes referred to as the sick man of Europe. And everybody knows that the Ottoman Empire is one day going to completely fall. And the real question is, is who is going to control all that vast territory once it does? And that um, ambition to control the remnants of the Ottoman Empire uh, is one of the sort of uh, sparks that will lead to World War I. So that's it. We are now halfway through the course. Congratulations, everyone. So where are we going to be going after Reading Week? So after Reading Week, we're going to be looking at the end of the 19th century. We're going to be talking about the Victorian age and Queen Victoria there. Hello. And we will be perhaps learning why we uh, celebrate Victoria Day in um, May and shoot off fireworks. We're also going to look at the darker side of the late 19th century and imperialism as European countries countries race to carve up Africa and Asia and put them under uh, incredible degrees of oppression. Furthermore, we will then be rumbling into the 20th century with the horrors of the world wars 
um, and the Great Depression, the Holocaust, the Cold War, so much to talk about. But for now, um, pat yourself on the back, you're halfway through the course, and have a wonderful reading week. <laughs>